Hi, my name is Edward, and welcome to the Edward Interview Show, where I interview people that I'm curious about. Today, we're interviewing a special man, Mr. Jonathan Garcia. He recently graduated from SAGU with his church leadership degree. Uh, he's been a bassist for the Temple Emmanuel worship team for as long as I've been alive. And uh, he's a mentor to a lot of the power youth that are here now. He helps out a lot behind the scenes. So without further introduction, let me introduce to you Mr. Jonathan Garcia. Thank Good you. To you. Good to see you too. Good to see you too. So what you got for me this evening? Well, um, I first off wanted to say that uh, I would consider you to be a very underrated uh, person, uh, you know, with the, with the church ministry, you know? Thank you, I think. Yeah, uh, it, it's a compliment. I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to, uh, you know, put, uh, put it at uh, the very first question I wanted to ask you is, uh, how, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. I just turned 29, and I'm excited for what's ahead. Got you. Uh, you're, you're 29. And yourself. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for asking. I appreciate that. Uh, you're 29, just turned 29. Uh, how are you feeling? Are you feeling uh, like, uh, you know, like young? Are you feeling like, oh, I'm old? Or uh, how are you feeling about this 29? I think I uh, feel two different ways about it. Um, on one hand, I do feel like I am getting older. I feel like time slipping away. But on the other hand, I feel like I have more opportunity than I've ever had. Wow. Um, I know age is a, a very, very complicated thing for a lot of people. Um, I turned 17 this year kind of recently, sort of recently. Well, happy birthday. Oh, thank you. You, you, you already gave me my birthday wishes. It's fine. Uh, but I, I want everybody to know that. That's why. Oh, okay. Yes, I, I turned 17 last month. Thank you for everybody. Um, I turned 17. I don't feel old. I think I've, I'd, I've never really felt old. But then again, I'm 17. Uh, you know, some people have different opinions about different ages. But you, you know, you're, I would consider you very, very young still. Prime of life. Prime of life. There you go. There you go. And uh, I already know you. You're, you're already setting up your life uh by uh you recently graduated from sagu how does it feel finally getting through those years and graduating from sagu there was, uh, was definitely some long years um i had been in college for a while and i dropped out at one point because i wasn't feeling it i was like i don't know if this is really for me but after a few years of being out of college i uh, rethought some things and thought that i'd like to further my education so i jumped it back into it and finish it off and the fact that I took a break and came back I think it helps me to feel even more accomplished mm -hmm. that I finished it off so I'm excited about it uh, that's great I mean finishing college is an amazing uh, landmark in a lot of people's lives it really does would you say college is the thing for for you know a lot of people that sets themselves up later on in life I, I think it can I think it depends on uh, the individual, I think college is a very good stepping stone to kickstart your life. But I don't think it's necessary for everybody. I think people can be successful even without a degree. Got you. Uh, we've talked uh, a lot about college uh, behind the camera and stuff. Uh, I do love your opinion uh, about school and, uh, and all of that. Uh, I think you're one of the people who honestly really did change my mind about college. Awesome. So, I'm glad uh, to hear that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I hope it was good advice. That's all I'm saying. No, definitely. If, I, I, I don't think I've heard a piece of bad advice from you. If it doesn't work out in the long run, please don't come back after me. No, it's, it's not your fault. It will be my fault, I, I think. But uh, you are honestly, I think you're very, 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 very smart when it comes to a lot of that stuff. Uh, would you consider yourself, you know, uh, well knowledge in a lot of like the college and school stuff? You know, just going through it yourself and talking about life experiences. It, that's exactly what it is. You just said it. I went through it myself. I feel like I made several mistakes in how I handled it. And that just kind of helps me to 
the things that I tell you, that's where it comes from. Just okay. the, the experiences that I had in life. Mm -hmm. I wish I had somebody to tell me the things that I might share mm -hmm. with somebody else. That's what it comes down to. I think, uh, you know, I'm truly grateful. I have a lot of people uh, who tell me, you know, a lot about my future and a lot about, you know, different life paths I can take. Um, for you personally, how do you feel uh, right now uh, being, uh, I'm going to say former member of the youth, because you kind of, you know, you're not, you kind of, you know, there's a, there's an age kind of thing on the youth. You're saying I'm past that age. No, that's no, that's not what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to say, you know, like, you know, the youth people now, you know, being a former youth member coming, you know, every Wednesday and stuff. Um, how do you feel about the youth group that we have today? I think uh, I love the youth. I love how each one of them has different personalities, different interests. All of them have, they all have potential. Yeah. It's, it's like I said, it just depends on the individual for them to find or make the best choice that's right for them. Just keep on moving forward. But I like the youth. I love them. That's great. That's great. That's great for me to hear. I'm, I'm part of For the all of them wa might watch later on, I love you guys. Yeah. I love, we, we love you. Uh, the youth has always been a very important part of, of this church. Um, I wanted to ask They're you. They're the future. Of course. I mean, I, I'll, I'm the future. And I'm You're the here. future, <laughs> Edward. You're the one. Yes, yes. But, but we do see through y'all. You know, so uh, how would you compare your youth group to the youth group that is now today? What are some of the similarities and differences that you see? That is a hard question. I know, I know, but it's it's very interesting. I would love to hear your perspective uh, going back when you were a youth and you know, having that full experience to me right now, you know, who's going So I think the, the one thing that comes to mind is, so for my generation, um, there was still things, not everything was digital yet. There was still a time when not everybody had a cell phone. Mm -hmm. There was still a time when I was growing up, social media wasn't a thing. Mm -hmm. There was not Instagram. There was not Facebook. And I'm not saying that those things are bad, but this generation grew up with always being plugged in digitally they've for the most part for the most of your life you've probably had access to instagram youtube i mean youtube came out what in 2005 i think yeah it's been a and when were you born a long time yeah they, well when i was growing up youtube was a thing so so it was a thing already so yeah. you were already uh immersed in this digital culture you had information coming at you 24 7 and I think that made life a little bit faster versus for us. We didn't have all this information uh, coming at us all the time. And I think that social media also can be like a comparison trap where you're looking at other people's lives. You're seeing how they dress. You see how they look. You see the things they have in their life, the success they have. And I think if you're not careful, you can allow it to affect you mentally. And I do think that it has for your generation and again, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but we just need to, everyone just needs to be mindful gotcha. of the effects that it can have. So I think that's one of the biggest differences is that your generation was far more plugged in digitally growing up than my generation was. Mm -hmm. And I think it has an effect on mentality, the way we think. Got you. Um, since you brought up the uh, point of technology, what do you think, uh, how do you think technology now affects churches that are building and stuff like that well like i said everything is digital now we live in a digital world and we see that even uh more so now in the uh you know with the pandemic that's going on mm -hmm. a lot of churches if they didn't have a digital presence and now they're just barely getting a digital presence now because of the pandemic they just barely started investing in it there's a lot of catch-up to do um, but I think it, it, it is very important. It's like a uh, new frontier. Um, you know, at a certain point in history, when people are talking about missionary work, they're talking about going into foreign countries, into different lands. The world's a very connected place now. 
and I know that there's still missionaries that need to go to different lands, but it's like one of the biggest frontiers now is the digital land. Churches need to, and the way that I look at it is that a lot of churches, Christians, when they create something for the internet, most of the time they're creating for other Christians, so it doesn't have the impact that it could ah. have. But if you change the way that you create content to target people who are not Christians, I think you could have a far greater impact. Yeah, I, I totally get you with that, um, you know, preaching to your own audience. Yes. Got you. Uh, I, I, I know the Preaching point. to the choir, the yeah, old saying. Yeah, there you go. Preaching to the choir, preaching to the people that don't necessarily, you know, might not have the same effect of people who don't have that in their life. Yes. Mm -hmm. Got you. Even like with the, the streaming that all the churches are doing, most of the views is probably coming from people who are already going to church. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's not really catching the attention of people who are not in church. Mm -hmm. How can we change that? That's the question. Gotcha. I don't have an answer for it right now, but I'm just throwing it out there. No, but it's a very important um, argument to have is how can uh, we as a church, you know, live streaming right now, you know, is the only thing that we can do. How can we use that to you know spread the gossip to the masses you know the gossip or the gospel gospel gosh i said gospel i meant gospel i said gossip gospel there's Sorry. a lot of gossip out there already <sighs> sir well i meant gospel but uh, i'm just amen, gonna amen <laughs> i'm just gonna i'm just gonna keep going it's not the gospel of john we're talking we're talking about the gossip of john right now <laughs> uh moving on uh how do you think do you think it's beautiful seeing um churches adapt to you know the pandemic that we're going to uh do you think this is something that you know god really wants to see I think it, it, it is beautiful. I think we've seen people making an effort to stay connected, even when the news is telling us, and rightfully so, social distancing. You know, limit the number of people that are gathering. But still, the church has tried to find ways to stay connected, whether it's uh, digital small groups whether it's meeting through Zoom, whether it's live streaming and creating content. So I do think that it's, uh, I mean, it is. It's, it's beautiful that people are trying to stay connected to each other because we need each other. Yeah. I need you. You need yes. me. We yes. can't uh, survive on our own. Yeah. I, uh, in the deep uh, depths of quarantine, I, I felt the need, you know, to talk to people, you know, to, to, um, the the human connection, you know, uh, that's a very important thing. I think it's especially for a lot of Christians now, you know. Um, you being the e-groups leader uh, for Emmanuel Church, how was it, you know, being the the whole the home Zoom thing? Uh, obviously, I go e-groups. I love it. But I want to hear about uh, your experience with e-groups and, you know, doing the whole Zoom online meeting thing. So we just started... Well, we had done e-groups before, but we were just starting a new semester of e-groups uh, this year. And when we first started off, we were meeting in person. And I think we had we started very strongly. We had about 20-plus people showing up at every single meeting. And I think people were enjoying it, too. So whenever this uh, pandemic came around, things got worse. We had to make the switch to digital meetings, and we did end up picking uh, Zoom. And it was different. Um, I remember the first time I had the meeting, it was not the same. Yeah. I'm used to, you know, talking uh, in front of people. You can see their reactions. You can see their faces. You can see if they're receiving you or not. But then in, in Zoom, it's kind of different. Like, you can still see them, but it's just not the same. It's mm -hmm. it's almost like there's not the same uh, energy there. Yeah. So I think that you have to go the extra mile mm -hmm. to try to create that energy and hype people up, yeah. basically make them interested. Um, but it, it's it's been good. 
I think we've had some great discussions. Honestly, some of the discussions that we've had on during e-groups over Zoom, I feel like there were better discussions than what we've ever had in person. Yeah. For some reason, maybe people are just... You know how it is, uh, they say the, the term keyboard warriors. Have yeah. you heard of that before, where people yes. get more brave online? <laughs> maybe that's what yeah. it is. I don't know. Uh -huh. Maybe they open up more when they're on Zoom, but it's been a, a good experience. Uh, the numbers did drop a little bit, honestly, from the 20 to what's uh, participating now. So I would encourage anybody who's watching to join us in, mm -hmm. and we can probably do a better job inviting more people as yeah. well. So mm -hmm. Got you. Uh, now that you've said the uh, the ups and downs of, of Zoom meetings and having e-groups online, do you think we'll ever come back, you know, during quarantine, having a, like a like a quarantined e-groups where, like, people are sitting, like, six feet apart from each other and, you know, you're still giving that presentation. Do you think that could happen in the future? That would be interesting. I think I would like to get to that point, mm -hmm. honestly, um, where we are doing, even if it has to be social distance, mm -hmm. where we do come together and meet in person. I think it's just a different dynamic. It's just yeah. different. Yeah, got you. Being in person, face to face, like I am with you <laughs> right now. Yes, yes. And I'm so glad I have this uh, platform to talk to you because, uh, you know, that's kind of the reason why we started the interview show is to have a conversation where in times where it's hard for that to happen, you know. So we've talked about e-groups. We've talked about um, uh, your your college situation and all of that. Um, now I want to talk about uh, your origins, you know, in church. Uh, you are a PK kid. I asked uh, Gabriel, your brother, Gabriel Garcia. This is Jonathan Garcia. And they have another one somewhere. Uh, but uh, I wanted to ask you your experience of being a PK kid. You know, I've had several people ask me this question before. And because when people ask this question, they want to know, like, what's the difference? Like, what was your unique experience growing up as the son of a pastor? And a, a lot of times what I say is, like, well, I, I don't know what the difference is because I've never grown up not the son of a pastor. So I don't know what somebody else's experience uh, looks like. You know, there's kind of the cliche thing of where um, – eyes are always on you and people are, are looking at you and they expect for you to uh, act a certain way or, or be a certain way or maybe people are more judgmental of you. I, I get that people say that a lot. I think that I never felt that too much personally, but I think what I did feel, and this is getting somewhat personal with me, um, I think that sometimes you feel like there is a... Uh, the tension between the church and yourself as the child of a pastor. Because a pastor is uh, like the spiritual parent of a church. So they have a whole congregation to care for. And then they also have their own family to care for. So I think there's a tension there where there's a tension that's placed on the church, but how much do attention do I get as a child? So I think there is that that makes it uh, difficult where... And, and I get that it happens to other people as well. For somebody else, it's, well, there's a tension between my, my parents' work. They're at work all the time and, you know, the attention that I get. Yeah. But I just think it's just like, well, they have a co-congregation to care for and they have to balance that attention. How much attention do they give there? How much attention do they give to their own children? Um, I think for me that was and, and I don't think that's something that I realized growing up. It's just something that I realized as I reflected on my younger years. You and I know it's like that for a lot of pastors' kids because I've talked to them before. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Uh, Gabriel, of course, he, he gave his own perspective. You can watch that on the Gabriel Garcia and Lijinska uh, interview. Uh, Gabriel talked about, I asked him the same question, you know, experience with a PK kid. And you kind of gave... You know, the answer you, you know, you kind of gave is kind of like kind of what the opposite of what he said. So it's nice to see a contrast of two, you know, people talking about their experience with that. Um, how much 
of having, you know, uh, a pastor mom and a pastor dad did come when you said, okay, well, I want to go to college and do this, or I want to do this in church, and, you know, that. How much of that pertained to you wanting to do those things? So you're asking me pretty much, like, how much that did my upbringing affect the decisions that I made to also be gotcha. interested in ministry? Mm-hmm. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, me? yeah. Okay, so, um, so as far as that goes... Um, I think that the upbringing upbringing did have a big influence on that, but my parents never forced me into any of that. Yeah, of course. I've never felt like they were trying to control the decisions that I made. I think they let me discover it for myself, because as far as ministry goes, I don't think that was something I was interested in to start off with. Uh, like you mentioned before, I've been a part of a worship team for many, many years, and I think that's the route I wanted to go to. And that's not that that's not ministry, but it's a little bit, it's just a little bit different than where I'm at now. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when I first graduated high school, I just wanted to uh, study audio and music and get into the music business and and uh, uh, my thought then was, and you know what, I'll just throw in Bible school at the end of that because every good Christian should know something about the Bible. Um, and as it turned out, I ended up just dropping out of you know, studying audio and just going into Bible school in San Antonio, not SAGU, but Impact Now, Shout out to Impact Now, out my to Impact Now homies in San Antonio. <laughs> uh, and that was those two years when I was in San Antonio. It was honestly one of the most in, important transformative experiences that I've had in my life. It redefined my faith. It, it, wow. it strengthened my faith in such a way that I can't even describe. Crazy. Um, And I think it was from that experience, being there, uh, really growing closer to God in those two years, that's where my interest in ministry grows from. It's that just being soaked in the Word of God and having services every day, pretty much, and being soaked in that, it changes your heart. It transforms your heart where you don't look at people the same way anymore. You have, uh, I'm not going to say more love towards them, because anybody can have, like, more love towards somebody else, you know. But it's just, you care for the destination of their souls. Let's put it that way. Uh, uh Got you. Yeah, I, I understand what you're... So that, I think, is what pushed me. I think God himself drew me into it. It's not that my parents forced me into it or I think that's just what God had for me. That was the will of God for my life. Mm -hmm. Uh, As we're speaking about like kind of your origins inside of uh, church, uh, we we interviewed e-worship last episode. I kind of want to hear your uh, perspectives and opinions, experiences on worship and being part of the worship team. Said at the beginning, you know, you've been playing base for worship team you know since i was born you know so i wanted to ask you what was your moment that you felt like you wanted to be in the worship team so i know that uh i did watch some of the e-worship interview um and i I really liked a lot of their stories where they said they saw people or on stage or they were at convention and they had experience and they wanted to be a part of that. But that's not really how my story is. That's not how I got involved in worship. So what it was is they were putting together a band at the time of younger people, kind of like y'all have now, and they didn't have a bassist. Um, and it wasn't something that I stood up and said on my own, like, oh, I want to be a bassist. That wasn't the case. It was actually my cousin, Raquel Gonzalez, who asked me if I wanted to play the bass. And she says that she asked me several times, and I really didn't 
you know, it didn't seem like something I was very interested in. But eventually I did pick it up, and there was a couple of uh, older guys that did show me a few things on the bass, a, a few basics. And from there, I was just started playing, and I've been playing for 16 years ever since then. Um, I do credit my cousin with the one who kind of put that passion in me, and she introduced me to it, and my uh, interest in music only grew from there, obviously. Um, like I said, I wanted to just study music at first, so it's something I was uh, very interested into it, but... But my whole perspective on it is I enjoy being part of a worship team. Anybody who's been on any kind of team knows that it just, you grow closer. There's a bond there. You grow close to your brother. Some of my best friends to this day are people that I played on a worship team with. So it does grow those bonds. And it's, it's like uh, an experience like no other, I would mm -hmm. say. Um, music in general I think it was a uh, movie or something that I was watching and it wasn't even about like worship I think it was a uh, maybe they were just talking about a jazz group or something but you're playing music with somebody when there's other musicians and you're all playing your part and everything is falling into place and, and the harmonies are there and the dynamics are there it just creates like this uh almost like a divine moment. Music is a powerful thing. Yeah. I don't know if you've just heard music and then you felt like little goosebumps oh, man. stand, yeah. you know. And that's the reaction we have to music. And if you're able to be the one producing it, it's an awesome feeling. It's an awesome feeling. And even more so that you throw the mix in, that you throw into that or add to that. I'm sorry, not just throwing into that. But you use all of that to bring glory to God. He's the one who gave us those gifts in the first place. And then we turn around and use that to glorify God. And I think that's the thing that all anybody on a worship team has to keep in mind. It is very uh, possible to get just distracted by the music where you want to just become so good at music where you just focus on the skill of it where sometimes you're not always mentally processing why you're doing it or why you're up on the platform or what is the purpose of you being there to lead other people into worship, to draw their hearts closer to God. So you got to keep those things in balance. There's two reasons. There's two things. One, yes, you have to be good. Two, about God and it's about bringing the people closer to God gotcha. that's um you you said a lot of the stuff you know at that you know Guile sat there and told us and you know Tammy from you worship you know she she told us about you know it being about God you know and taking a step back so that God can truly step forward and uh um off topic you're very well spoken well thank you um, I wanted to ask you about, um, you kind of, I think you speak well too. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, hopefully I'm good. I, I interview people for a living. So, uh, uh, I wanted to ask you about kind of, uh, is, uh, Christopher, our, uh, kind he's, he's our, our very, very new, his young brother is my student that I teach mm -hmm, a very, very new bassist in e-worship. Um, would you consider Christopher uh, kind of like passing, would you consider that passing the torch? Absolutely. So it's been a while that I've thought uh, I want to teach somebody how to play the bass. Yeah. Um, and it's not only in that, if you know, this is not something that I always go around talking about. But if you really dig down into, like, the way that I think and the way I approach life, mm -hmm. I do have a desire to um, teach others, not just music. Just I'm talking about, like, the way of the Lord. I'm yeah. talking about the Bible. I'm talking about 
like even things we've talked about in college it's like what can i pass on to other people so that you know what they they can go maybe further than i was able to go so that they don't make the same mistakes that i made yeah i got you that interest is kind of what got you into studying uh church leadership at saigu uh (laughs) yes and no Um, (laughs) okay that thing kind of well tell us about that so that thing just kind of like fell into my lap so to make a long story you know i started talking about how i i first studied music Mm -hmm. and that's the thing and i had already had like almost 60 credits in that that's half of a bachelor's degree so how do you go from that to getting into a degree that's ministry focused yeah well, at Sagu, the answer is the church leadership degree because it's a very <laughs> flexible degree where you can bring in a lot of credits from other classes that, you know, you couldn't do that if it was a business degree. They're not going to let you bring in 60 music credits into a business d- degree. They w- that won't happen. Uh-huh. But the church leadership degree, it's a flexible degree, so you can say that, well, here's these leadership classes, and then you have these music classes. So that, what does that mean? Well, it's kind of like you have a church leadership degree in music, like you're a music leader <laughs> in church. Yeah, I got um, you. And that's, so why did I pick that degree? It's because that was the fastest route to getting a bachelor's degree. Mm, got you. I don't necessarily recommend that to everybody. Mm-hmm. It's worked out okay in my case. Um, but I'm not going to sit here and say that it wasn't uh, beneficial to me because Yes, I did have to take leadership classes as a part of that degree. And what you'll learn through that is that leadership is all about uh, influence. It's all about moving people. So if I say that I want to uh, be able to uh, influence others, you know, help them to move forward, the only way that that's going to happen is if, Others see me somewhat as a leader, someone that they can look up to, someone that kind of knows where they're going. If people looked at me and they say, this person, they don't know what they're doing. They have no direction in their life. That person is not a leader. They would not even take the time to listen to what they have to say. But if they do see someone who they're like, well, this person might know something, I'm going to take the time to listen so, um, so yes, the leadership study, studies, they did help me. They did shape my perspective and things. They did shape how I approach others in the way that I want to help them. That's what leadership is. Mm-hmm. You're just helping other people. But the thing about it is that most of the time you can't help other people unless you're a good leader because uh-huh. they won't follow you. If yeah. you're just bad at it, Got you. that's what it comes down to. Wow, that's uh, I, I didn't know that, and I'm I'm glad I I know that now. You you've told me a lot about um different paths that you can take in college and stuff like that, and you know stuff that not to take, stuff to take, you know that type of stuff. Uh, that's exactly why I tell you, because I fell into maybe a path that would have. As I look back at it and what I'm trying to get into now, I could have taken a better route. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's other classes I could have taken that would have prepared me better, that would have put me ahead. So Mm -hmm. So, uh, growing up, was it, did you know that you wanted to, you know, do something with church or like, what was your, what was your dream job growing up that you were like, I would love to do this one day? You know, I. Was it a rapper? No. Did you want to be a rapper? No. I'll get into that. Give okay, me a second. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. So, it's something today I feel like I have a much clearer vision of where my life is headed than I have had at any other time. That's good. I'm not going to say that I have 100%, you know, this is what I'm going to be without mm-hmm. a doubt. No, I'm not going to say that. However, I do know more about like what my purpose is and my purpose drives what I do and my decisions and what I pursue. But growing up, I was all over the place. 
Uh, I started off when I was a young, I wanted to be a police officer. That was probably my dream wow, job. I didn't even know that. And then I wanted to be a lawyer at some point. And then I got into this video game that was about flying, uh, you know, fighter jets. And then I wanted to be an aeronautical engineer. <laughs> and then I wanted to be a music producer when I started making beats when I was probably around your age. Yeah. And then uh, I, that's when I, even early college, that's what I was studying. But then all of a sudden I ran into a, uh, I don't even know what you would, would call that. Uh, it wasn't a quarter life crisis, but some <laughs> kind of crisis. And yeah. It was at that point that I started seeking God more sincerely, and that's what led me to go to Bible school at the ripe old age of 21. That's how I ended up where I am today as an e-group's leader. So, so uh, you know, going over your origins, you know, about stuff now, I want kind of kind of want to get, you know, your opinions or, or your perspectives on this. Uh, uh, what do you think about uh, Gabriel's, your, your brother Gabriel? Uh, what do you think about Pastor Gabriel's uh, kind of like, you know, of course, him starting up this ministry, you know, Emmanuel Church, uh, the English service, you know, what are your opinion, what's your opinion about like him starting up that ministry, you know? My opinion is that it's a great thing. It's a needed thing. Um, I think that when we're talking about Emmanuel Church, what we're talking about is having a service or a congregation that reaches out to English-speaking people. Mm -hmm. And uh, Emmanuel Church comes from Templo Emmanuel, yes. which is a yes. Spanish-speaking yes. church. And... I think maybe over the last 10 years or so, it's been something that's probably probably been talked about. You yeah. know, like we want to have an English service. And we even tried launching it uh, once before. And it just kind of died out. And uh, now was here was another opportunity to try that again. And this time, the first time, it wasn't under Gabriel's leadership. This time... I think it's it's like like what we were talking about earlier, the passing of a torch. It's the passing of a torch to a new leader, which is my brother. And and I think that's the way it, it needs to be. For yeah. something like this to be successful, it needs to be in the hands of a of a new leader, I think. Someone who who thinks differently, who approaches yeah. ministry differently. So I think it's a, a great thing. Yes, we are at our humble beginnings right now, but nothing is impossible with God. Yeah, definitely. You know, Rome wasn't built in a day. And uh, uh, what is your feelings and uh, uh, what is your perspective, experience, feelings, anything you want to tell us about um, him, you know, of course, telling you if you wanted to be the e-group's leader? You know, what was your what were your first thoughts whenever, you know, he brought that up to you? So I moved back closer to home at the beginning of this year. January twenty fourth was the last day that I worked at my job in Magnolia, Texas, which is an hour away from here. And I had already been feeling when I was working over there. And I still came to this church during that time, but I was not able to be as present. I could not contribute as much to the ministry here. And I had already been feeling for some months in my heart that I wanted to contribute more at Emmanuel Church. That is uh, what I felt God was calling me to do. And when I made that move over here, it was already it was already something that I knew that I was going to do, that I was going to be more involved, that I was going to contribute more. And so whenever my brother approached me about it, I was willing to take that opportunity. Mm -hmm. Whatever was put in front of me, whatever needed to be done, I was going to do it, and I am doing it now. Yeah. I'm not going to sit here and say, uh, 
you know, I'm the best e-groups leader ever. But <laughs> I do I do put my effort into it. Yeah. And I do want the people who come to it to get as much out of it as they can. Gotcha. Um, talking about your, your old job, you worked at a, a rehabilitation center. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so I worked at Adult and Teen Challenge of Texas, the Magnolia Men's Center. It is a Christian substance abuse rehab. I wanted to ask because I'm very well, you know, everyone's, everyone kind of knows that you, you work there. But not a lot of people know your experiences there, some of the, the, the great moments that you had spiritually there. Uh, can you talk a little bit about working there and seeing, you know, these teens and, and that? Well, at our campus, it was men. So 18 wow. to 60 something. And the, is that. Do you think it's it's harder to teach adults, or do you think it's easier for to to so for adult crowd? Working with the adults is difficult, but there also is a teen center, and I've talked to the guys that work at the teen center, and I would say that it is di- more difficult to work with the teens. Um, it's it's very hard to from what I've heard, to build trust with the teens because growing up they've been hurt so much. And I think by the time <coughs> by the time adults come into our program, they've already been uh, hurting for a while. They've already been making mistakes for a while. They've already been trapped in addiction for years. They've been hurt by it. They've seen their families broken apart by it. So I think they're more willing to uh, to change. They're willing to, to, they're more open to accepting what we can offer at Teen Challenge. Wow, that's interesting to think about. Um, what are some of the experiences that you get from, from working uh, at Teen Challenge at a, at a place like that, you know? So I think one of the things that stands out in my mind is a lot of the men who would come into our program, they start off when they first come in, I would say that they're somewhat hardened. They're not exactly open to the whole idea of a Christian rehab because the way we approach it is not like the way other people approach it. Um, We approach it addiction as a spiritual problem so we provide a spiritual solution we believe in a teen challenge uh, is freedom from addiction through christ so it's as you build a relationship with christ that you're able to find freedom from substance abuse and i think a lot of the men when they come in they're not so opened up to that idea they don't know is Je- is jesus really gonna work to set me free um you know, is all of this Christian stuff for real? Uh, and as they uh, spend time in the program, you can see the transformation in them. A lot I've heard several different men say where, you know, before I would never feel bad about certain things. It, we're talking about like conviction. Mm. I would never feel con- convicted if I if I did this. I would never feel convicted if I, you know, used meth, Mm -hmm. if I, you know, whatever drug they're using. Meth was one of the most common ones, but, or I I never felt um, convicted if I was lying about something, or if I knew I was even something as small as breaking a rule, because there's a lot of rules at Teen Mm -hmm. Challenge, and so as they spend more time there, they would say, but you know what? Now I start, I do start to feel bad about these things. Like I know that I'm sinning now and I recognize it and it doesn't make me feel good. And to me, that shows me that there's a transformation there because mm-hmm. the only thing that softens anybody's heart towards sin is the Holy Spirit. Wow. And that means that they have allowed the Holy Spirit to begin to transform them and soften their hearts where once they were hardened when they came in but now they're open to allowing the holy spirit 
to speak to them. And, you know, I've heard uh, several guys uh, say that, and and I really can't uh, say, I can't give away too much information because there's, like, confidential laws involved, <laughs> actually. But there's this one uh, student that comes to mind, very intelligent, probably one of the most intelligent people that I've ever met in my life. You can just tell how fast they're able to process information and they are just able to see things differently. But he had a lot of doubts um, about God. We know he would go to church services. A minister would pray for him. He would receive a word from the Lord. Even at one point he was speaking in tongues, but then he would always come to doubt it. Like, was, was that for real? And, and also just the way he was such an analytical person thinking like, maybe the only reason I'm thinking this way is because I'm just surrounded by all these Christians all the time. Mm. If I was in a non-Christian environment, maybe I wouldn't even be feeling these things. Maybe it's just because it's where I'm at, mm. just because it's the environment. Otherwise, I wouldn't be feeling, thinking, experiencing nothing. But right now, he has completed the one-year program right now he decided to intern at teen challenge so that means he's sticking around longer to be a part of the ministry and to help other men who are going through the same things that he did and now he feels a call to ministry he feels that he's called to ministry so despite that he went through all of these doubts here's a man who feels called to ministry now, who's, who's doing it as an intern at Teen Challenge. And that's one of the stories that sticks out to me the most. Wow, that's, uh, that's a great story, honestly. That just, you know, seeing that, 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 just amazing, you know. Um, it, it's, it's, it's been great talking to you, of course. You have a very, very, very well- amount of knowledge, you know, to give people and stuff. But uh, the people have some questions for you. Okay, bring it on. <clears throat> Let the people speak. Yes, yes, yes. What are some hobbies that you have aside from music? Well, uh, reading is one of them. Um I haven't been a read reader for a while. I was when I was younger, but like in the past two years, I started picking it up again. Mm -hmm. So reading is one of my hobbies. And uh, of course, you're the Bible. That's uh, that's one I I can already say you read. Any other books that you're interested in right now that you want to put on some readers at home? So the only one that comes to my mind right now is uh, 12 Rules for Life by Jordan B. Peterson. Very good book. It just talks about a lot of different uh, rules for life. Basically, that's what it is. Like different principles, different mindsets, different actions you can take to be successful in life. So like the first chapter is about lobsters. <laughs> okay, got you. Because... Uh, well, anyways, it's just about kind of like walk around like you have some value and you have something to contribute. That's kind of what that chapter is about. But it's a great book. I encourage you to check it out. You know, Lobsters. How to Be Filled with the Holy Spirit by A.W. Tozer. It's another one I just finished reading recently. I would also recommend that book. Got gotcha. you. you know, lobsters, they don't die. They live forever. Unless they uh, somebody kills them, you can search that. Is that out. true? Yeah, I think so. So uh, I haven't fin listed, uh, finished talking about my hobbies. So go ahead. I mean, if you have, go ahead. Uh, other so hobbies. running is another hobby that I've picked up recently. Well, I've been doing it for years, but only be getting more serious about it now. Um, and I'm not like a big time runner or anything like yeah. that. But recently, I just. Uh, hit a 10 a 10k run so i didn't participate in a 10k event but i ran a 10k 
which is 6.214 miles without stopping. So just straight six miles. And I don't know for a lot of people, it's six miles, whatever. But for me, that's the longest I've ever run. So I'm excited about that. Um, Also been doing uh, some writing is another hobby of Mm -hmm. mine. I do have a blog. I haven't probably posted anything in a while. But I do also write on the side. I keep, you know, just write my thoughts down, different ideas. Um, So, yeah, those are probably like the main hobbies that I have. This next question is uh, one that everyone at home has been wondering. And uh, I I can't believe we're finally going to get an answer. Um, are you single? Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, the answer to that question is yes, I am single. Um I'm open to a relationship. Uh, <laughs> if you have any friends, wow, uh-huh. any single friends that you f- that you feel uh, would be a good match, hey, you let me know. That's great. That's great. Um, next one kind of pertains to uh, what you were just talking about. The first question: uh, Can you give people watching some health tips for during quarantine? Well, I, I don't consider myself. The healthiest person out there but you look good you look good what i can tell you is drink a lot of water ah yes i can tell you that don't eat because of your emotions just because you feel bad mm-hmm. don't just go eating something yep. don't eat that much bread or for the hispanic <laughs> households don't eat too many tortillas <laughs> uh just for me it's all about smaller portions I know, and I'm not a health expert, but the way I view it, my philosophy is you don't have to go looking for a special diet unless you know you're going to eat that way Mm -hmm. for the long term, unless you commit to it. Because for me, I'm probably not going to, um, you know, trying to be fix up the most healthy recipes for my entire life. That's just that's just me being real. Mm -hmm. So just eat less. That's all it is Got about. You. Eat less. Wow. Um, That's great advice. And, you know, don't go crazy with unhealthy food all the time. Mm-hmm. Everything in moderation. Desserts, chips, no sodas. <laughs> How are you doing uh, fast food-wise? Have you been cutting down from that? So I, do, I like to avoid fast food whenever I can. Um of course, you know, every once in a while, I might indulge in it. Um, like what? Whataburger. <laughs> yeah, man, that's, that's my weak spot, too. Uh, next one is something I actually really, really am wondering. Cardio. Lots and lots of cardio. <laughs> okay. Yeah, go ahead. Cardio. There you go. Cardio, eat in moderation, and run six miles. There you go. That's the, that's those are Weightlifting the- is not bad. If you want to lose weight bigger your muscles are the more calories you burn doing nothing even so <laughs> got you shout out to Gabe's gym uh, sponsored by <laughs> Gabe's gym <laughs> i believe he's charging a membership now is that correct <laughs> yes Gabe's gym the the very famous garage gym uh this next question is uh very 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 interesting cuz i'm wondering this so I want to ask, are you improving 16 years of playing? Are you still to this day improving at the base? Mm. That is a question that is very near and dear to my heart. And uh, I'm going to give you the whole story from the very beginning. When I first started off uh, as a music- as a musician, I didn't. Re- I don't think I realized how important practice is. Mm-hmm. And me being real with you, when I was younger, like a teen, I think I was cocky. <laughs> like I thought I was just like good, just mm-hmm. by even not practicing. Like I didn't have to practice. I yeah. was just, I was just naturally, maybe a little bit better. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I only the only practice I got was playing at church on Sundays. 
never really practiced. And one day, this one uh, brother from the church, he recorded us playing. And I had that recording, and I played it back, and I could hear myself playing. And I thought to myself, well, that sounds terrible. <laughs> and so at that moment, I think I decided to start practicing more. Um, so for me, it's always been, I have been playing for 16 years. Yes. Have I been seriously practicing for all 16 years? No. Um, there's just been different periods throughout my life where I was more disciplined in my practice and then other periods where I was not as disciplined um and it just comes back to like what are my priorities at the time like when I was an impact now we had a very busy schedule didn't really practice too much then when I came home yes practice some more now last year I probably practiced a lot uh, well, 2018, I know I did. 2019, so-so. 2020, not so much. Not so much. So am I improving right now? No. No, I'm not improving <laughs> right now. Okay. Um, Is there room for improvement? Yes, there's a lots and lots of room for improvement. When it comes to mus musicianship, it always. sky's the limit. You can yeah, keep on pushing always. and pushing and pushing. There's always something more. Um, I think we're... I'm at with that is that even though music is a very big part of my life and I love it, I th there's other skills that I want to prioritize at this time. Gotcha. There's um, a little rumor going around, and this is, uh, this is more gossip than gospel, but mm. uh, there's a little rumor going around. And, uh, I'm not going to say who told me this or anything. There's a little bit of a, a rumor talking about uh, you possibly retiring anytime soon. Is there any truth to that happening? Um, I, I think that's like a yes and no question. I believe that, I believe in passing the torch. Mm -hmm. I think I have played on the worship team for a very long time. Do I always want to be a part of the worship team and jam out every once in a while? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Would maybe I rather someone else step into that and be a part of that more often than me? Yes. Not because I don't enjoy it. Because I want other people to have that opportunity. Because, like I just said before, it kind of ties into... There's other things that I could be focusing on right now. Mm -hmm. And that's what it comes down to. Not true. I guess that's in the air. Uh, anyways, this is a, a good question for a lot of the viewers that are going to be watching. Um, this is the last question, and it is, what is some advice you would give to someone getting out of high school? That's a very good question. And there's just so many different ways you can go with that. Mm -hmm. When it comes, even when it, because this is like a topic that when it comes to like making life decisions and, and life advice, it, it's something that I've I've looked into a lot. Yeah. Um, I, I love browsing the internet, so. Yeah reading articles and watching videos on, like, that topic. Um, and I think there's almost, like, different philosophies in how you approach that question. Uh, some people might tell you, first getting out of college, it's, it's more the time to experiment, to, to have uh, fun, to do things that you won't be able to do later on because of your obligations. When you get married... You gotta. You have kids. You have to keep a job. You have bills. Those things restrict your freedom to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. So maybe someone would say, "You know, now's the time to to do something crazy, to take a risk. Because if you take the risk now and it doesn't work out, well, it's not really that. You still have a lot of time left. Mm -hmm. But then there's probably another school that says, uh, "No, like when you get out of." high school like double down hard like focus 
do every, you know, try to make all the right decisions, get the degree, get the good job, get your 401k savings account <laughs> so you can yeah. retire when you're 35. Uh, so it's kind of like, where, where do I advise between those two extremes? And I'm a very big believer in a balanced approach. Mm -hmm. So I say, yes, do take some risks. Do try to have some experiences. Uh -huh. But don't have those at the expense of trying to provide a solid foundation at the same time. You should still be trying to get building up work experience. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter what kind of job, it honestly doesn't. You should still try to build up work experience. You should still try to educate yourself, whether that's in college or on YouTube, learning digital photography or something like that. That would be my advice is just try to have a balance of enjoying yourself and also being responsible. Well, uh, that's the, uh, that, that is now the, uh, the end of the interview. It was honestly really, really great having you on. And uh, thank you for I'm having me. I'm so thankful for you uh, taking your your time out of uh, uh, being a successful man and being here and letting me interview you. Thank you for giving me the privilege to interview you. And uh, without uh, anything else, thank you everyone for watching this interview and getting all the way to the end. Uh, Jonathan really did say some amazing, amazing things. Uh, and uh, with that, we're going to go ahead and we're going to say goodbye for this episode. Thank you for watching. Please watch the next episode. Follow us on all social medias right here. Thank you, Gabriel. And uh, with that, we're going to say goodbye. <laughs>